that was the president of our Pearland Chamber of Commerce and uh, delivering goods and uh, things. And uh, I wait till she finishes her mission. Carol Arch, thank you so much for what you do in the way of playing Santa Claus and the job you do with the Chamber of Commerce. Is that it? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, let me open a regular meeting of the City Council of the City of Pearland for December the 9th, 2019. It's hard to believe. You please rise. We'll have an invocation tonight by Councilmember Owens. Councilmember Carbone will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. Would please bow your heads with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, Lord, I pray and thank you for the many blessings and prayers that you've answered for each and every one of us. Lord, as we go through this season here and now through the Christmas season, let us not forget exactly what this is all about. It's uh, the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, as many things are going across the nation today, we pray actually for our police department here and other police departments within the city. There seems like right now there's no recognition or support for the police departments as, as we're losing them on daily. And Lord, we just need for you to put your arms around and embrace them as they go out within the cities, Lord, during this period of time, this time of year brings out the best and the worst of all people. Lord, we ask for all these prayers and blessings in your name. Amen. Come in the pledge. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. Pledge allegiance to these passes. One state, under God, one and indivisible. That's the truth. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. We, um, <laughs> it may be approaching the end of the year, but we have a council meeting to do, and we're in the process of doing that tonight. If you want to follow our action, if you have the agenda, I have, I'll be working from the same agenda that you might have a copy of. So we can, uh, and I'll, I'll announce what that is as we proceed so that you can keep up with where we are in the process. Moving to item number three on our agenda, which is roll call. And we have all of our city council members here with bright and shiny faces. And uh, we are in process of moving to finish out the year before too many more council meetings, before too many more days. Moving to item number four, uh, citizen comments. Councilman Little. Thank you, Mayor. Well, we have four citizens that wish to speak tonight. Two of them are on items on our agenda, so we'll wait till we get to those items. But then we have two. Um, one that would like to speak on Paraland Animal Services. Uh, Lisa Lake, please approach the podium. Limit your comments to three minutes. Okay. I'll let you know when you're down to 30 seconds. It's not here. Okay. State your name and address, please, also. I'm Lisa Lake in 2009, Westminster. Dear Mayor and City Council, I ask for further investigation into what happened in the case of Mies Coombs, who was killed at the Pearland Animal Control, November 30th. I'm a resident of Pearland for over 20 years and an avid supporter of our police department. And until now, I had never really thought I had any problems with Pearland Animal Control. I understand that the police department has sent out information on social media. The actual incident report is not available until tomorrow. But from the information that is available, I have more questions than answers. While some citizens are crying out that this is a terrible mistake by what probably is an overworked and underfunded shelter, that doesn't appear to be the issue. Unless the city can answer some of these questions, the issue will not go away, but hopefully this can be resolved. 
Daryl Coombs was told that her cat was assumed feral and wasn't checked for a chip until after it had been killed. The cat was healthy, had clear eyes, shiny fur, and was well fed. She was neutered, tattooed, and chipped. There was no information to show that the staff based their feral determination on anything other than the behavior of a scared cat. Any pet picked up could have been in a similar state with a lost collar tag and choosing to fight since they couldn't choose flight. State law requires a check for a chip be made prior to euthanasia, and that you can see in the packet I've provided that. Um, it also requires that those performing euthanasia be trained. They had told Cheryl the cat couldn't be fed or watered the entire time they had it. it seems that some method should have been figured out. State law requires that animals receive food and water. We still have no information on how the cat who would not eat or drink was killed. State law requires that stat dogs and cats be euthanized only by administering sodium pentobarbital. Please note that the only humane way to administer this drug is by injecting the animal. If the cat could be injected with the drug that killed it, it could have also been sedated to confirm there was no chip. Please refer to the Humane Society of the United States Euthanasia Reference Manual for the injection methods that's provided. Page 94, the IC method, would be the only legal method available. Please note that the animal should be unconscious for this, and that would be the perfect opportunity to once again have checked for a chip. Please also note that page 75 lists unacceptable ways of euthanasia, which when dealing with a cat are all against state law, section 821.052. In the IC method of euthanizing a cat, one might be concerned of the city of Paraland's cost for administering a sedation drug for every cat. It appears that there is plenty of money allocated for this department. 30 seconds. Looking at the budgets from 2016 to 2019, Animal services expenditures have been an average of $81,000 under their original approved budget. Thank you for your time and consideration. I hope Cheryl's answers to the questions related to her specific case will be answered. Why were there 72 hours not adjusted for the holiday? Why were protocols avoiding violating state laws for chipping not followed? How and why was her healthy neutered chip cat killed? So before the next city council meeting, I hope to have insight on why is the shelter allocated money they are not using? Is the state involved in this incident? Time's up. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The next person wishing to speak is our very own Carol Art. Please give your name and address and limit your comments to three minutes. I'll let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and uh, those of you in, in the audience. I'm Carol Arts Buchek, President of the Paraland Chamber of Commerce, 6117 Broadway, Paraland, Texas. And I'm here to bring good tidings, not sad and workable things. It's Christmas and it's the holidays. So I want to wish all of you a wonderful holiday season with your family and friends and, of course, our community. Great uh, event over the weekend promoting Pearland in our city. We're very, very, very happy that our city is doing so well, and I'm certainly happy to be with the Chamber of Commerce, who is a partner with the city. And so tomorrow night, we are hosting our annual Christmas open house from 5 to 7. You're all invited, 6117 Broadway. It is a lot of fun. And generally, we have a board of director band and sing-along, but our pianist passed away this last year, so we have a karaoke. So we're doing Christmas karaoke. For any of you who like to sing, or even don't like to sing, if you can read and follow music, we would love for have, to have you there. And just bring a smile upon your face. It seems like everyone's all down and out tonight with this business stuff that we have to deal with. But tomorrow night, you can come, let it all hang out, and sing some Christmas carols with us. Thank you so much. That's good. Thank you. Mayor, that completes our citizen comments until we get to specific agenda items. Okay, thank you. 
Moving in our agenda to item number five, we're going to change pace here just a little bit. Public hearing is the second hearing, voluntary annexation of 18 acres of land generally located east of County Road 48, Kingsley Drive, north of County Road 59, which is Magnolia Parkway, and south of Floor Park Lane and Southern Trail Subdivision, which is the description of the item for the public hearing tonight. Staff review at this point. Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Hardy will be uh, going through the presentation. This is the second required uh, public hearing for this voluntary annexation for the area you just described. But Mr. Hardy. Thank you, Mayor, Council, and uh, Mayor, almost as accurately as you described, this public hearing is number two in the uh, two-part series that uh, provides the public with the opportunity uh, to provide comment and receive the information we have regarding the uh, <coughs> proposed annexation of 18 acres uh, in the uh, County Road 48, County Road 59 area of the ETJ. Uh, the address of that location is uh, 2985 County Road uh, 48. And as the map shows, uh, this is the uh, uh, boundary of that parcel, parcel identification number 179014. I do want to go back to that slide and make a correction. There was a discussion item in the last public hearing as to whether or not that property had uh, structures on it. Um, uh, staff erroneously reported that there were. There are no structures on this property, just to uh, make that correction. I believe there was a, a, an error with the, with the map. The boundary uh, shifted a little bit to make it look as though properties uh, south of that property were included, uh, structures rather. Uh, but we want to make it clear that this is a vacant uh, this is vacant land. Uh, the location map here shows where that uh, parcel is located with regard to the city. And this is the future land use plan uh, for that area. Uh, it is low density residential and there is a retail node located at the uh, intersection of County Road 48 and County Road 59 just south of that property. Upon completion of this second public hearing, uh, staff will engage the property owners in the process of developing and uh, creating the process moving towards acceptance of a service agreement. Uh, we anticipate that uh, taking place a latter part of this month, early part of January, and following that, we will proceed with the second, with the first and second readings of the ordinances uh, sometime early in, two, in 2020, uh, and the zoning process is to be determined. Uh, with that, that completes my staff report, Mayor. That completes your report at this point? Yes, sir. Okay, moving in our agenda to uh, citizen comments. These are citizen comments for this particular public hearing, not for the ones you gave when you came first in, came into the audience tonight. Council Member. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak on this item? Second time, anyone in, in the audience wishing to speak on this specific item? Third final time, anyone wishing to speak on this item? Okay. Moving in our agenda to item number eight, uh, eight which is the uh, opportunity for this, the council and the staff to discuss the issues relevant to this particular public hearing. And uh, I'll start with the city council. Council Member Owens, would you have any comments on this item? No, Mayor, Mayor I don't have any comments on it. Uh, no, my apologies. I wasn't in attendance in the uh, in the first meeting, but generally, um, uh, just a couple questions uh, related to utilities. I, I assume that the, this property was included in the um, the model for the utilities uh, that serve this area, or would an extension be needed? I'm more. Um, oh, one second. I'm sorry. Member Perez, it's included in the modeling, but it would require extensions of both water and sewer. And we would we would put it on whoever develops this property to, um, to pay for those extensions. That's correct. Uh, other than that, I have no objection. Okay. Moore. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and we have uh, adequate police and fire to cover this new area, or are we going to have to make additions? 
Uh, from our perspective, the area is uh, relatively small. It's contiguous. Um, uh, from uh, both public safety standpoint, uh, don't see uh, any impacts. Um, you know, it, obviously, uh, this is the annexation, not the development. I mean, uh, that depends a lot. But um, in that size of area, um, we would not have issues covering. Thank you. That completes your report. Yeah. Councilman Hernandez? And no comments, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Belittle? Nothing, Mayor. Councilmember Carbone? And Councilmember Rolando? Nothing for me. Okay. Moving to staff discussion of this item. Mayor, that completes our staff report. Okay. You're like you said or no, huh? Okay. That information in the record, let's move to item 10, which will let me, uh, no, number nine, which adjourn this public, public hearing, which I shall do at uh, 649. Moving at our agenda to item number 10, which is a consent agenda, I'll ask uh, Councilmember Orlando uh, to handle this and uh, ask the Or Mayor Pro Tem, if there were any items to be with help from the item. Okay, good. Councilman? Consideration and all right, yeah. Consideration and possible action of the consent agenda with the exceptions of items B, F, G, and H. So moved. Second. What was the first number? Letter? Uh, B. B B G and H. B F G and H. Okay. Any other comments from council at this point? We do have motion, motion second on the floor. Did I hear a second on that? Yeah. Okay. We're in staff report. Uh, let's let's move down to item A. With uh, yeah. We have a, a motion and a second. Council Member Orlando, how do you vote? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Perez? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Consent agenda A through H passed 7 to 0 with the exceptions of items E, F, G, and H. Is that correct? B. Was it E or B? B is in boy. Correction. Yeah. <laughs> okay. With the exception of B, F, G, and H. B, F, G, and H. Uh -huh. All right. Now for B. Consideration of possible action. Uh, second and final reading of ordinance number 1585. So moved. Second. I have a motion. Right. We did have a second on that item. Why don't we move to staff report? So item B, as in boy, uh, may read in council as the uh, second reading. You saw this uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this is required as part of the amendment to the existing TERS number two program. Uh, we're adding projects and amending existing budgets. Uh, one of those being the uh, FM 521 work. We're cooperating with uh, uh, Brazori, I'm sorry, with Fort Bend County uh, to move forward. Uh, others being amendments to the uh, library project. Uh, these are all uh, eligible for funding by the TERS number two. Uh, as improvements within that district, uh, the TERS will end in 2029, and uh, these projects will only uh, progress once they have completed them, uh, gotten all the paperwork done, been reviewed. Uh, and then they could get in line uh, in the order in which they are completed. So uh, these would uh, be the step that would allow these to go through that uh, process to, to be reimbursed once they're completed. Nothing to add, sir. The council have a question or comment on the staff report? I do, Mayor. Um, and it's just uh, some information on here. Uh, I've gotten some information from uh, Shadow Creek. Uh, from the kids over there, uh, or some of them, three of them, I think it is. Uh, looking at uh, additional funds or other th ways that we can do and improve the crosswalks, 
I believe that there's been a couple of accidents over there on kids trying to cross uh, street crossings over there in order to get to school and on the bicycles and they've been hitting and we've had several uh, near misses over there and maybe the police chief may be aware of those in that area over there. But I was wondering if can we use any of the funds off of this to look at different cross sections or crosswalks in and around the schools over what improvements we might be able to do. And uh, Councilmember Carbone has received the same information that I have. If, if there's information uh, that'd be helpful to receive, uh, but uh, as council should be aware, uh, there is a separate TERS project that we've advanced and that's for uh, sidewalk uh, gap fillings and extensions. You can't replace or repair existing facilities uh, with the TERS monies, but we do have a, a line item uh, for those. And so uh, uh, the things that you mentioned, at least, uh, those sound more like uh, regular maintenance items and we can take a look at those regardless and outside of this, we don't have to wait. So just share that and we'll take a look at it. But that's, uh, I don't know if that any of that would be germane to these amendments that we have before us right now for tonight. Yeah, this is, a, I, I can get you a copy of that. This is a, a school kids that have put together information to look at these different crosswalks of what may be able to be done to make improvements on it where the kids will be safe going across these areas with uh, bicycles and going into school. So I'll Again, get, we'll take a look at that, but the amendment is for uh, the library mm -hmm. and for the uh, FM 521. Another question or comment from council? Hearing none, I believe we have a motion second on the floor, Madam Secretary. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Perez? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Okay. Consideration and possible action resolution number R2019-300, so moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Uh, this is a uh, resolution uh, moving forward with uh, additional uh, radio units for the fire services. Uh, there'd be a combination of uh, I believe, uh, a couple three that are based are fixed into the equipment and the rest are mobile equipment. Uh, so these are all configured to integrate with the rest of our system and provide uh, communications as we expand Station 8 and other areas. Nothing to add. Council, have any question or comment based on staff report? Uh, did I hear somebody? No. We'll okay. I'm Secretary, I believe we've got a sec motion second on the floor here now. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little? Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Perez? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Okay. Consideration and possible action resolution number R2019-301, so moved. Second. A motion that a second will on the floor. Staff report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, this is a uh, renewal of uh, uh, equipment that's used in our traffic department. Uh, uh, sound sign blanks and uh, various uh, materials. Uh, it is part of the renewal and as such, uh, we can't consider other parts or other uh, vendors from where this came, but uh, just uh, renewing the same terms or uh, that came through uh, when we looked at this first time. Councilor, any question or comment or on the staff report? Yes, sir. thank Carbone. you, Mayor. Um, I, I pulled this and I know this is renewal, so maybe just a comment for going forward. And I realize the lowest bidder did not provide or cannot provide the refacing service, um, but the the lowest bidder is about 40k less in total from what I see. So, uh, as this comes up to to renew, can we see about bidding it out or separating out the um, I guess the new signs versus the refacing surface? Yes, certainly for uh, future. Appreciate the observation there and uh, we'll take another look at that too. Okay. And when will this, uh, are we out of renewals? I think this is this the third, is this the last, Eric? I think, I think there's one more renewal. And then one other thing I would point out is that the, uh, the recommended award is to a company that provides signs within five to 10 days, depending on whether it's a resurfacing or a new sign. Uh, whereas the other bidder uh, 
their terms were that they would deliver signs within 30 days. And so that was another factor in, in the in the decision point. Okay. I mean, do we, well, we know when we're building a road, by it's, do well, we carry an inventory in case a stop sign gets plowed over or something? Well, we do carry inventory, but then there's also street signs and other signs that, you know, we don't carry everything. So oftentimes we're, we're looking to get signs delivered quicker. Uh, we, we don't have a huge warehouse, so we can't a lot yeah. of things. And on new roads, of course, they're part of the contract, so we don't uh, use this for that. But uh, it's for re sign replacements. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any further question or comment from council at this point? We have a motion second on the floor, Madam Secretary. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Little? Aye. Councilmember Hernandez? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Perez? Aye. Councilmember Owens? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Consideration and possible action, resolution number R2019-304, so moved. Second. Um, Mayor, we have one start. citizen that would like to speak on this consent. Agenda item eight, would Larry Milliken please come up to the podium and state your name and address, and you have three minutes. I'll let you know when you're down to 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, my name is Larry Milliken. I live at 934 Plantation, League City, Texas. I will say, though, that I am a property owner here in the great city of Pearland. I own two houses in uh, the Meadow Green subdivision and two houses in the uh, Shadow Creek Ranch subdivision. Uh, having said that, I'm wanting to speak about flooding and um, the adverse things that happened to all of us here uh, a couple of years ago. But um, the city of Leak City has um, done two things since the flood, is that we went out and addressed a lot of the concerns to the flooding within our subdivisions and, and the activities surrounding those. Um, we increased our, our uh, uh, capacity in, the, in our system to, to now we're uh, engineering to a 2% storm rather than 1% storm. Um, we have raised that base elevation for houses, hoping that we could, if we eliminated just the people that flooded by six inches, that would be a third of the folks that flooded in League City. On the other side of that uh, is that we also addressed or are addressing looking at the, the problems of, with the flood control in both the Clear Creek watershed and the Dickinson watershed is that, that as everybody knows, the Clear Creek watershed not only affects League City, but it affects all of us, is, is that it originates way up in, I guess it is Fort Bend County and comes through Brazoria County, goes down through Galveston County and borders on the, the north to Harris County. We challenged, as a council, we challenged our city manager, Mr. Baumgartner, to um, address those concerns to see if we could lead um, in that area as far as a regional solution to some of the flooding. And, and I, I passed out on each member on the dais today a, a map of all those flood areas from the Clear Creek watershed and the Dickinson watershed. And that makes it a little difference when you look at it as a whole and looking at, at that green space as far as how big that watershed is and what it all entails is that um, everybody uh, in Pearland, they would enjoy a base elevation or an elevation somewhere around 25 to 30 feet, I guess. And down in League City, we, we're lucky when we get to be having 15 feet. So the getting water down the creek is is um, is something fairly easy, and once um, once that water comes down, then there's no stopping it, and that's the reason why I'm here. And um, Mr. Baumgartner presented to city staff um, a proposal for the working of an engineering study for um, the Clear Creek watershed, and um, I would like to. to impress upon you how needed that is so that we can uh, hopefully find a regional solution to that, that watershed problem. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, this is uh, an interlocal uh, agreement for a, uh, a flood study, and uh, as was just noted, uh, it is being put forward or spearheaded by uh, League City, but obviously these things uh, uh, are regional in nature and, and take partnerships. Um, we've uh, met with uh, the League City staff and their engineering firms. Uh, we're very comfortable with uh, moving forward on this recommendation at the level that's uh, noted, uh, given uh, the substantial work that the state of Pearland has done to date uh, with Brazoria Drainage District Number 4. Uh, our position uh, primarily upstream on the Clear Creek, and uh, uh, we're willing to, we suggest moving forward on this study, uh, and then we'll take into account and see any of uh, uh, the findings and, and, and specific projects that come down the road and consider those on those merits and the benefit for Pearland. But uh, at this time, you know, I think as a, uh, a regional good, goodwill effort, if you will, uh, this makes sense to, to at least uh, be a partner and, and uh, we're already scheduled and they've invited us to attend to a meeting on uh, later this week. So we'll stay in the process, report back uh, as this uh, re engineering review goes forward. That's all. Okay, does the council have any question or comment based on the staff report? I got a comment, Mayor. Okay. I already told y'all what the comment was, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think the mayor and I and probably Marcotte out there was on city council years ago uh, after we had a storm come through here and, and uh, lost a lot of uh, property here. And, and uh, we had gotten in touch with uh, Friendswood and, uh, and actually League City and Dickinson to talk about doing some cleaning on the Clear Creek, de-snag and whatever on there and uh, in order to stop, you know, some of the flooding or hopefully prolong it uh, doing that. And we knew it wouldn't stop at all, but there was some opportunity to do something. And basically we were told that they did not want to do anything mm -hmm. on Clear Creek uh, because it was too pristine and beautiful to look at. And I said, well, that probably doesn't ring much at 3 o'clock in the morning when you get out of bed and the water comes up to your knees that uh, when you look out on Clear Creek, it's not that beautiful anymore. So, but uh, I am glad to see us moving forward with that to do something on it. But we took a lot of valuable land here in Pearland during that time or since that time or retention and detention areas that could have been used for something else. But uh, as uh, people here at the city, we uh, was decided we need to do uh, those kind of improvements here to hold the water off of uh, us as, as much as we could, and also the uh, people downstream to us. So, just want to reiterate that, Councilman, City Manager, and uh, and I told you I'd do it, so I promised you that. And uh, but uh, there's not too many people up here that remember that. Maybe two of us and one out in the audience. That's all I have, Mayor. Okay. Anybody else? Any other council members have a question or comment? Uh, yes, Mayor. Just a couple of questions, if I could um, borrow the gentleman for just a second. Uh, I had just a couple of questions. Um, uh, no way in opposition to the contribution, but just to um, understand. Um, so uh, y'all scope is from Dixie Farm to, uh, to Galveston Bay, correct? So you could basically yep. dovetail over with... Uh... Yeah, that's that's the original. But let me say is that, that the difficult part about that is that when you, when you just stop at Dixie Farm, the water still enters the creek at Dixie Farm. Um, Dixie Farm is going to be a, a, a very definite line when you look at the creek because of the oxbows and the, and the bends in the creek. And um, currently right now, um, the Clear Creek Watershed Steering Committee we review every other month, we review a lot of projects that's happening on Clear Creek. And um, Mr. Upton can probably brief you all on those, but let me say is that that snagging and, and all that has been done. Um, it's actually the shelving and the activity that's happened in Friendswood to date. There's a tremendous amount of inline detention that's going to be uh, uh, literally thousands of acre feet of water that's gonna be retained in the city of Friendswood. Um, that, that's all in a part of the activities going on. It's not just the activities that, that um, Woody spoke about, is that they, there is a lot of retention, uh, but quite frankly, when you look at the watershed and to think about <clears throat> lowering the effective level of Clear Creek 
three feet at I-45, um, it's going to take the cooperation of the entire watershed of the entire region, not just one area from Dixie Farm Road. But we are, as far as projects go, looking at that. But the projects that that are are being talked about today are projects like tunneling or or diversionary canals and things of that nature, not so much just channelization of Clear Creek, um, because then the lower half of Clear Creek, when you get in and to the Webster's and the, the Nassau Bays and you know El Lagos and those cities around Clear Clear Lake itself, then then that alternate act, getting that water out of Clear Lake then becomes an issue too. But um, yes, it, is that the study is from that lower from Dixie Farm Road down, but if we get the water out of Dixie Farm, if there's a diversionary canal or, or tunnel or some sort of activities that are done, then it will relieve the pressure um, on the downward stream from Pearland. And uh, I assume y'all be coordinating with Friendswood based on the results of their, their recent bond election. I know they're going to be putting a lot of investment in to study of uh, their portion of Clear Creek. I don't know how that dovetails with what y'all are doing, because I know a good portion of this overlaps their area. Actually, all of the different jurisdictions are working together. That was one of the main thrusts of, of the study, is that if you notice in the data sheets, it talks in terms of the Corps of Engineers, the Harris County Flood Control signed on for four hundred and something thousand dollars. They, um, um, it, it's a it's a concerted effort of all the different jurisdictions, and it takes into account all of those things. In fact, Galveston County is is doing a countywide study currently right now of its drainage activities, and the engineers that that'll be working in this are going to be actually utilizing a lot of the engineering data that is current from Galveston County uh, for this study also. I appreciate it. Thank you for the clarification. <clears throat> Any other council questions or comments? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm not a drainage engineer, and I mean, 25K on a study, I'm cool chipping in for, for the regional issues. Now, if it, if it comes back and says, hey, there's a $40 million project and we're coming back, I'm, I'll need a better explanation of how spending that money off-site is going to help us here in Pearland. But, um, so I, I guess my yes vote is a yes at 25K, um, but, but not a pr presumption that we're going to spend more. Yes, sir. I, I'm, not, I'm not an engineer myself. I, I'm actually a real estate person. But um, having said that, is it, let me assure you that it, it pretty much is the projects that, that we believe might be identified in this study, and I've, it, again, the engineers are the ones that are doing it, are going to be multi-jurisdictional activities that we're hoping to capitalize on that $4.2 billion that the General Land Office has for multi-jurisdictional projects, $100 million or more, is that... Um, Literally, if you talk about building a diversionary canal, you're talking about hundreds of thousands or if not billions of dollars, just like a tunnel, so that there's no jurisdiction that's going to be able to float those kind of dollars. Thank you. Any other question or comment from the council? Uh, I would just have to, I, I don't know why engineers are always looked at with condemnation. We always we try and do the best we can. Uh, I appreciate uh, I appreciate the effort. I, I've talked. You know, we had a conversation with Ken Clark uh, some time ago, uh, Commissioner Clark, about this, and um, I expressed to him and others in the area expressed our, our desire to help uh, study. I think if um, I know my member Carbone has his reservations, uh, uh, which are justified, but I wouldn't say that it's not worth approaching us if we have if we have a project that we think is of value and um, uh, helps uh, clear the downstream water, that helps clear the upstream water. So um, I would say that I'd be supportive of a, a project that proves value for Pearland in the future. Um, but uh, to, to Member Carbone's uh, point, we, we, we need to prove the value. Hopefully the study will, will do that. And uh, hopefully we can cooperate with you and get, um, uh, get this Clear Creek issue, which has been a longstanding issue for longer than I've been alive, um, uh, uh, resolved, and I really appreciate y'all y'all working with us on this. 
So will the remaining balance, um, the contingency, I mean, what, what will happen with that? Because it's considerable some money that we put forth on this that we're not spending now. Sorry, on the, uh, uh, the, the bu our budget piece of it, you mean, where yes. we're getting that from? Yes. Yes, that's transfer. I think that's where that, we identified the source of funds. So That's just the source of funds for okay. the $25,000. There's no contingency or any other funds allocated okay. or being contributed to this at this point. Okay, thank you. Any other question or comment from Council? Very done. I believe we have a motion second on the floor, madam. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Perez? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Okay. Moving to new business item number two, Council Member Little. So Consideration of possible action, first reading of ordinance number 2000M-194, so moved. Second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second for any discussion. Staff report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, this is a uh, first reading for a zoning change. You have seen this at your uh, JPHs. Uh, this does come with a, a positive recommendation. Um, uh, the applicant, uh, Ms. Pollock Kevins, is uh, uh, seeking a, a rezone from the GB to a, a general commercial district uh, for this property at uh, Manville and Fight Road that's been activated. So, thank you. Nothing to add. That's my, I believe that's was label for cost for carbon originally. <laughs> You've been inside of number one. Yes. Some council, comments from council at this point? Yeah, I, I, um, I'm probably going to wait till next time it comes out. <laughs> but uh, I read all the information is, uh, that was sent to us on uh, from uh, the folks on, on this property and, and looking at putting in another uh, storage facility. So um, that's what it is in there, and I guess you know we'll look at it, but. Uh, when it comes out again for the, if it's a storage facility going to put in, my vote is going to be no. Uh, the comparison on that, uh, what they've done compared to the renters in Houston versus the renters in Pearland. We don't have that many renters in Pearland, but uh, on a storage space. But so I'll just save my vote for later on, but I'll go ahead and vote for this. But uh, discussion when it comes out again, I'll be totally against it. Uh, uh, briefly for staff, uh, with the uh, change in zone, what uses open up uh, that would be allowed either by right or by conditional use uh, if we allow for the zone change? General business and general commercial are very similar. Uh, it really allows more automotive intense uses within the general commercial district. Um, those would be similar to uh, your drive-throughs and, uh, like I said, the uh, storage facilities, things of that nature. The, the mm -hmm. more intense uses. Uh, and forgive my goodness, with the with the storage facility under with the zone change, uh, would that require a conditional use permit before it could be approved? The storage facility actually requires a conditional use permit in either general business or general commercial, which is why they were able to apply for the December uh, joint public hearing. I'm sorry, say that again. They were able to apply for the December joint public hearing, uh, which will be the next upcoming uh, meeting because it already has a general business zoning uh, designation right now. Well, I mean, I guess we're not, we're not zoning for the use, but if they're, if they're allowed for the use under the same conditions for either zone. This is two lots, uh, so they're changing the zoning for both properties. Okay. One lot, the corner lot, is what is proposed for the uh, storage facility. So they're, they're, ex they're expanding... You're expanding the zone so that it's all contiguous, or 
It's the second the property that signature companies owns. Okay. Um, I, I would generally say, regardless of the storage facility, and we can we can measure that with the conditional use. Um, I, I don't think that this intersection is inappropriate for uh, general commercial. Um, so, and it's general commercial is directly across the street. The uses there, I don't think, are inappropriate. Uh, 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 inappropriate, so I'm okay with the zone change. The, the use may uh, may come up for discussion in the future, but the zone change is fine uh, for me. <laughs> Council, have any other other council members have a question or comment at this point? No, no. I just comment, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> a few years ago, we approved a a storage unit on 518 and. There was a little bit of flack over that. Um, and I, I don't see an issue putting it back here off a of fight in uh, County Road 1128. It's off of, you know, a major roadway. Um, 1128 or Manville Road has not really developed to a major roadway yet. Um, but I, I don't see an issue putting it here. Um, storage storage uh, facilities usually don't create a lot of traffic and with uh, this being on the corner across from the uh, uh, Rogers Middle School there I, I, I think it'd be a good place for it um, it'll help keep the uh, traffic down um, opposed to if it was uh, some other kind of retail store that would create a lot of traffic in that area and contend with the uh, school um, school traffic in the morning and the afternoon so I, I really don't see an issue of being here any further comment or question, Council? Mayor, I want to clarify. It, to mine, uh, it's not the location or whatever. It, it's a number of storage places that we have within the city of Fairland right now. And uh, it's getting so crowded. If you look on 518 down toward 288, we've got uh, two storage places within 200 yards of each other on 518. I just think there's a better use for the property we had around here than storage uh, that we got. And I would ask uh, our staff by the next uh, meeting that we have when we start talking about the storage areas, I'd like to know how many square uh, footage that we have on storage facilities in Pearland right now. Because most of the justification uh, that they sent to us uh, to look at on there shows uh, uh, us comparing us with with uh, city of Houston and more on the comparison is for renters uh, than anything else uh, as compared to Houston's renters versus Pearland's renters. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'd like to know how many we got in Pearland. We're coming out on 518, uh, quite a few storage places uh, around here, and I think there's just a better use of our, our property that we have here. So, but I would like to have some of that information. Uh, when we get ready to discuss this at the next meeting. Since this is consideration only of the zone change, Mayor, I have no comments. Thank you. <laughs> you have no comments either. <clears throat> I don't think there's, there's an awful lot of development out there, so at least if we had something going uh, put in, it, uh, that is, uh, would be something we'd like to see but in there, I think it would stimulate that uh, whole area from a, from a business standpoint. Council, have a further question or comments? Uh, Corbon, would you have further comments? I don't believe we've run out of questions here, Madam Secretary. I believe we've got a motion second here. Council Member Little? Yes. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Perez? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Motion passes 7 to 0. <clears throat> okay. Over to the new business item 2, Council Member Little. Thank you, Mayor. Consideration and possible action. First reading of ordinance number 1584 1, so move. Second. A motion and a second. We're in discussion. Thank you, Mayor Council. This is uh, our traditional uh, first uh, budget amendment. Um, now that we're into the fiscal year and we've done some of the preliminary, uh, emphasized preliminary closes on the FY19 financials, there are a uh, number of projects that uh, continue over into the budget years, and we need to uh, recognize those with the budget amendment. Uh, we do have a 
A couple other recognitions that uh, we recommend consideration for, uh, but Mr. McCarter, Assistant Finance Director, will uh, walk you through that presentation that's included in your packet. So. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is John McCarter, Assistant Finance Director here with the City. Um, and tonight we'll present Budget Amendment Number Two. Uh, I'm sorry, Number One for your consideration. Um, just looking over the agenda for tonight, uh, the majority of the expenses we'll talk about tonight are carryovers. So we'll start with defining what a carryover is. Uh, we'll touch briefly on the unaudited year-end standing uh, for general fund and water and sewer. Um, I want to reiterate what Mr. Pearson said. These are unaudited numbers, so these are our best estimates at this point. Uh, they will change by the time we come back uh, in January to talk about uh, a projection, a multi-year projection, and we'll see that firm up at that point, but this is our, our best guess as of right now. Uh, then we'll go through each one of the carryovers uh, in general fund, water, and sewer, uh, and talk about some FEMA adjustments that we have in here as well. Uh, then we can answer questions. We'll be back here in a week for the, uh, the second reading. Um, so defining carryovers, uh, as I mentioned, this is the bulk of what we're talking about here tonight. Um, essentially, a carryover is, is really the process of moving the expenditures and revenues from one fiscal year to the next. Uh, this is a standard procedure uh, in local government operating funds uh, because not everything fits ni nice and neatly into one uh, fiscal year. Uh, for us, we're pretty explicit about what we define as a carryover and what is not. Um, most of these are goods and services that were ordered in fiscal year 19 but not received by the end of the fiscal year, so we have to pay them in the correct place. This just moved to the budget that allows us to do that. I also see some special projects that were budgeted and scheduled to be complete by the end of the fiscal year, but were delayed, so we're wrapping those up in the early uh, FY20. <clears throat> um, also, each year at mid-year, we do a mid-year allocation. You'll see several of those items on this list as well. Um, carryovers are not small dollar items, uh, so we don't carry over anything that's less than $1,000 as a line item. Uh, those are absorbed into fiscal year 20 budgets. Uh, these are not meant to compensate for reductions during the FY20 budget. Um, we did go through several rounds of those, so this is not to compensate for anything that was removed from the budget. Uh, and these are not operation supplies or recurring expenditures. You will not see salaries. You will not see things like office supplies listed um, in those, those items. Uh, if you're looking for the full line item list, it's on page 14 of your packet. Uh, that's every, everything that's getting carried over with a count number, a short description, uh, and an amount. So starting with the general fund, uh, this shows our preliminary FY19 year-end income statement. Um, starting with revenues, we did are projecting to finish about $600,000 over in revenue. Uh, we met our numbers in both property taxes and sales tax, which is a good thing um, there. So we, we are within just that $600,000 there. On the expenditure side, the $3.2 million represents about a 2% uh, variance from our projections. Uh, this number will likely change because we do have... Um, outstanding invoices for FY19 that haven't posted yet. Uh, so we will see this number. I, I would bet that that would come down as a variance of total. Uh, most of that, about 1.3 million, is for salaries, salary savings uh, from uh, vacancies, and also uh, overtime that wasn't expensed and some part-time expenses as well. Um, so that brings us to our amount over policy of about $3.9 million uh, for the year end. Again, likely to change the next time we talk about this. Um, the FEMA reimbursement items, so we talked about carryovers uh, prior. Uh, these fall into the adjustment category, so I, I believe it was a little bit over a week ago we were notified by FEMA that we would likely get our reimbursement of, of about $1.6 million uh, for our uh, expenditures uh, from Harvey, Hurricane Harvey. Uh, staff is recommending that we go ahead and allocate the general fund only portion of that now. Um, this will all remain on hold until we actually see that check hit the bank. Um, so we will not be expensing this until we actually see this come through. Uh, but we will not be back for another budget amendment until July. So this allows staff to move ahead once we receive that payment. Uh, instead of waiting until July, we are not considering um, other funds as a part of this because we don't have anything uh, pressing to tackle right now. Um, this was talked about in Mr. Pearson's transmittal letter uh, for the FY20 budget. Uh, the notes on the right kind of tie that back. Uh, the asset management and the comp plan uh, both match exactly. The vehicles of $420,000. Uh, one of our goals over the next few years is going to be to get rid of all of our Crown Victorias, uh, which are uh, expensive and, and quickly aging. Uh, this takes care of six of them, leaving us with 16 remaining. Contribution of $200,000 to streets and sidewalks, and then a contribution of $280,000 to fund balance. Uh, that's a little bit more than the two months to keep us uh, where we want to be in terms of that two-month uh, recurring uh, expenditures, that brings us to the 1.6 total. That's our 
Uh, what we have is our best number from FEMA right now in terms of, of that amount we're going to get. So putting all of this together, uh, we have $906,000 uh, of carryovers. Again, you can find those on page 14 of your packet, uh, tied with the $1.3 million of expenditures, $1.6 million of revenue uh, for that FEMA reimbursement. Uh, that puts us roughly $2.9 million over policy uh, is our projection right now. Uh, we will have a white paper that discusses some um, mid-year allocation possibilities. We'll tackle that in February. Um, and then we'll go ahead and do the allocation in July. Um, so we will revisit that year-end number, but we are, we are showing here that we have the resources to cover both the FEMA uh, items and the carryovers uh, with the current resources. Moving along to Enterprise Fund, um, this is a little hard to read uh, because we did a refunding this year. So those variances of 20 and $30 million uh, actually aren't that big. You see about $27.9 million in revenues and expenditures for the in and the out of the refunded bonds. Um, so on the revenue side, we finished about $2.7 million over. Uh, that's almost entirely due to sales of water and sewer. Uh, on the expenditure side, um, we uh, finished about $7 million under, 3.2 of which is going to get carried over. Uh, so $3.8 million was the amount that we finished under on the expenditure side, just talking about the operations piece. Uh, $500,000 of that was savings from the refunding. We saw some salary savings in there as well as some lower than expected uh, purchases of water uh, throughout the year. So all of that tied together uh, brings us to the $9.8 million over policy here. We'll roll that over. Uh, the $3.2 million worth of expenditures being carried over. You can find that detail on page, I believe, 15 of your uh, packet uh, with all that. Um, again, just adding to the resources uh, at the end of this fiscal year, uh, projecting a uh, contribution of $705,000 uh, to that fund balance. Uh, there are also a number of other funds included. Uh, the special revenue funds, most notably, there's funding for the train depot renovation, which was outlined in a Thursday packet that went out, I believe, two weeks ago. Um, we also have some funding for the ongoing natatorium project that was um, detailed in another Thursday packet a few weeks ago. Um, motor pool fund, obviously a lot of vehicles outstanding uh, to be purchased with a long lead time there. Uh, we also have a new fund here, our infrastructure redevelopment fund. Uh, this $491,000 re represents the remaining balance for street and sidewalks maintenance in FY19. Uh, we are essentially recommending that we create this new capital fund um, to get these big dollar street and sidewalk budgets out of general fund uh, because they're really not operational in nature. Uh, so in addition to this $491,000, we would put the $200,000 uh, for the FEMA reimbursement and the balance of the FY20 budget uh, all into a new fund, and that would automatically roll from year to year. It would really be kind of similar to the way the motor pool fund is set up. That would just kick that off of general fund. We'd still talk about it, still be central to our discussions, uh, but we'll just make it a little bit easier for our friends in public works uh, to orient that the way they need to. Uh, the total amount for FY19 with all of that would be about $1.8 million of streets and sidewalks funding. Um, and then lastly, PEDC funding here, <clears throat> $1.5 million uh, that is detailed in a packet uh, that went to their board and was approved on uh, 1030 of this year. Um, and so the detail is attached in your packet as well. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Mr. Kirsten. We will be back here one week from today for the second reading. So again, Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, uh, a lot in there, but um, I believe through our earlier communications, we you've seen all this before and uh, you know, uh, the items are uh, all positive and in line with uh, what you've seen. And so I uh, recommend we move forward, uh, but uh, very open to any questions or clarifications that you might have. It's not really September 16th, it's December 16th, so. <laughs> you know, it's a little further question at this point. And, uh, just, that, just that does get a little complicated, uh, mixing. Uh, the way we have to we had them spend money last month before before October one, and uh, the fact that it has to be, it would be in the the next budget year and trying to re reconcile that it's a, it can be a little confusing at times. Uh, but I think you did a good job on it, so appreciate that. Council, have any question? Uh, not really a question, uh, Mayor, but uh, just for clarification for those in the audience, we're. The second reading would be next uh, next week, correct? Next week. So the the, the slide is uh, just got a typo. Yeah. <coughs> uh, other than that, I'm comfortable moving forward, and I appreciate all the work and effort uh, put in. Hernandez, just want to say that I think it's a very good thing that we're getting 
new vehicles for the police department on National Night Out. I had the <laughs> privilege of riding in one of those old Crown Vicks, and uh, it took two different uh, attempts to get it started, and uh, it, it was leaking water inside. So uh, I think our PD definitely deserves better vehicles, especially you know if they're needed for an emergency. So I'm glad to see this. <laughs> That's good. I appreciate that. Any other, any other comment, uh, Councilman? I've got a comment, Mayor. Um, I commend the staff on the three plus million dollar uh, positive variance. Is there any way we can use some of this excess of the uh, policy minimum um, to pay down some debt? We'll come back to you at the uh, uh, budget process, but uh, at this juncture, you know, the levy's been set and, uh, you know, it'd be more appropriate for looking at options with the fund balance for FY21 then. But uh, we're blocked in for, for the current fiscal year. <clears throat> but the debt levy's been set, so that's uh, locked in. <laughs> Councilor, have any other questions or comment? I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, if you go back and pull up slide five, a couple questions there. It might just be semantics on there, but it, it says um, replace Crown Vix. Are we still, yeah, six Crown Vix fully equipped at 70K each. Are we going back to the Crown Vix or are you talking about replacing those with the new Explorers? Good question. That's confusing. We'll update that for next time. It will be Ford Explorers that will be replacing these. Okay. So we're replacing the convicts with explorers. Perfect. All right. Um, and then on the asset management at 500K, um, can you remind me again what that what that's for and what that entails? Well, it, uh, we did have a packet about it uh, recently in the process, but I guess uh, Trent can just give you an overview about that um, part of it. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Uh, yes, Council Member, uh, the uh, asset management system is uh, it's an implementation of asset management system that'll cover not only public works and all of our infrastructure there, parks as well, our plants, our facilities. And uh, it's basically an implementation similar to in size and scope of the ERP, um, of which we'll be able to track, analyze the longevity and the life of all of our assets, be able to do more predictive uh, sp spending and analysis of where our spending goes to optimize that. And I think most importantly in the short term is to replace our work order system, which dates back to the HTE system, which we replaced all but the work order system with the ERP implementation. So uh, we've got a very antiquated system for managing and tracking um, our work orders, uh, which don't necessarily tie back into our GIS and our infrastructure there and don't provide automated updates and feedback to those that have... Um, uh, sent in work orders and work requests to us. So it's uh, it'll eliminate a lot of those manual uh, processes. Okay. Um, if you go to slide seven, the enterprise fund. So once you pull out the, the refunding, um, what we got revenue was up 2.7 million because we sold more water than projected? Yes, to residents, yes. And then I guess the the flip side of that is our expenses were down by roughly 3.8 because we didn't buy as much water. Yeah, and that's just a shift in where the water resources were coming from, and that doesn't account for the whole variance. Um, right. I have to follow up to get you a number, but yeah. But on the on the cuff, you know, on, on the back of 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 us hearing about residents being told they're having water leaks and the, the new meter issue is on their side, not ours. You're telling us we sold $2.7 million more of water and we didn't have to buy almost $3 million of water. So that tells me that maybe the meters are, there is a concern there, right? So the whole $3 million is not from sale of water. I know, I'll, I'll have to get you a specific number, but that is okay. not, that is a component of it, but not $3 million. Okay. But even if, it, I'd, I'd like some more detail on that because that doesn't jive um, with the residents that are saying, hey, you know, my, my bill's been higher. I mean, there, we've heard several of those stories, and I keep saying, hey, if that's the case across town, we'd see it in some high-level analytic, and, and here it is. We're selling more and we're purchasing less. So help me reconcile that back to somebody that says my bill's been higher than ever before because of usage. 
And if you go to slide nine, um, you'd mention the, the depot. Um, I guess that's in the special revenue fund. Yes, sir. Uh, um, the uh, CVB Hotel Motel fund. Okay. And that, I mean, that, that was something we had earmarked and we're just carrying over yes. from last year for this year? Yes, sir. Okay. And it's still, um, I haven't seen that that memo I'm still catching up on them but is that that was a, a I think a dollar for dollar match in the past is that still the case so councilmember Carbone if I may um, the Thursday packet which you probably haven't seen um, back in November on November 13th that was presented to the CVB advisory board uh, to go ahead and move forward with the expenditure of those funds the CBB advisory board unanimously recommended moving forward with that. Now, prior to that, city council, uh, when we brought this to you the year before, we had uh, told you that the total project was about $900,000 and that there was going to be fundraisers and some other things that took place, brick paver project, et cetera. That's raised about... Uh, roughly $10,000 worth of funds, plus another, uh, some additional funding for a video that uh, talks about historic pre preservation of the depot. The bottom line is, is what this ultimately would be doing is authorizing the money to move forward and actually start construction uh, within this next year for that project, which would be just be the first phase, and that's only the restoration of the depot itself, including the exterior, the roof, the foundation, um, basically 100% restoration of the building. The facility is in a case, it, it's in a state right now that if it's not renovated within the next couple of years, the reality is it's going away. That facility uh, is in need, and that's what this money is recommended for. Okay. Th thank you for that clarification. I guess in my mind, you know, it, it was a million-dollar project. Um, council, last time we saw it, um, we agreed to match dollar for dollar, and I think the, the committee was going to raise a half million. And I, I was comfortable with the expenditure because we were matching somebody else's dollar. I guess now it sounds like we're putting the first 500 up and we'll see what happens. I would uh, say the facility needs to be renovated, period. And the million was for not just the renovation of the depot. It was also for an ancillary building called an event uh, facility, which was going to be utilized for um, different types of rentals. That's not part of this. This is strictly the renovation of the depot. It also would include, and I didn't mention this earlier, would be accessible, uh, ADA accessible restrooms. All right. I, I guess at a minimum, if we could attach that Thursday memo to the second reading of this ordinance, just so it's out there. Absolutely. Um, for the public. And I don't know, I'd be interested to get council's feedback. Because we had a lengthy discussion last budget cycle. Mm -hmm. Regarding this, mm -hmm. and are we cool throwing 500k at it without a match? Piggybacking off that, are, are we going to? Is it going to require council approval to authorize that 500,000, or is that is, is it considered that it was already done? Ultimately, with this approval, that would be um, part of the your package. authorization to move forward with the project. You certainly would obviously approve a contract once it came back before you, but this would be the money was allocated a year ago. This money would be carried forward, and then the recommendation is to move forward with the project within this next year's time period. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, my, my understanding was... Uh, the same as member Carbone said that was matching, so I would like to have that discussion at the second reading as well. Yeah, I would be interested in uh, discussing that at a uh, second reading also. Um, but I, I do have a question. So this will be all the construction and everything will be run by the city. So the city will hire the contractor to do all of the work. 
That's correct. Also, once this ultimately, if this project is approved, it would be submitted to the project department. They would put it in line with all of their other projects, <clears throat> schedule it out, and it would be bid just like we would do any other city project. So it would be run completely by the city. <clears throat> is this not something a historical society could do to hire the contractor to do the work? You're going to get it about half price. I would say that uh, we wouldn't do that on any other city facility. This is a city of Pearland facility, so I would recommend we do it in-house like we do all other projects. If we uh, move forward with this, um, I'd say <coughs> even without the, the matching element, it's not locking us into any other uh, portions of the, the total, I guess, concept, right? This is just saying we're allocating the funds to the restoration of the depot itself, correct? Any additional work would be... That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is um, is this out of hot tax money? Okay, that's what I was wondering. You know, I think it's really a, you know a shame. We need to go ahead and get this thing going for sure. Uh, this edition of the Tech Stock Magazine come out with about 125 cities in the state of Texas that they were asking people to go to and visit because of different things uh, in the city. And you know, I think it's. Uh, for us, Pearland was not even mentioned, and we're 125 years old. Uh, we're not retaining any of the history as it is right now of the city of Pearland, where people actually come in and put you know heads in bed to really uh, come in and, and 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 do anything. But but I thought it was you know from from TechDot of uh, actually putting it out in their magazine, and that you know Spring was. I don't know if Lake City was on there or not. I don't remember on there, but there's quite a few cities around here that uh, have so many areas in there to explore, and that's how the uh, tech stock put that out, showing you know different uh, opportunities to go into different cities and, and what to do. And so we're, we're missing out on that for a city that's 125 years old, and really the only thing we've got is left is that out there uh, on there, and I'd really like to see us move forward on it. I think maybe maybe for clarification, we're just talking about a budgetary allocation, but not approval of a project. Correct. So we, we this is a, a budgetary allocation, mm -hmm. yes. But the intent <clears throat> is clearly to move forward with the project upon approval, inclusion into the budget. I think, at least with for the purposes of this um, uh, of uh, this agenda item, I'm okay allocating the money for the project with the condition of we still haven't approved the project. Um, you know, I think there is still some uh, heavy discussion uh, to be had when this, uh, when this project is intended to move forward. I think there's a lot of things that are gonna change between now and, and then. Um, I, I'm okay with staff's recommendation to allocate the funds, uh, but not necessarily uh, saying that's a preemptive approval of the project moving forward. Um, I know that's splitting hairs but uh, we're just we're just trying to make sure that we're moving money into certain accounts for um, future expenditures. So I think uh, everything that the, the other council members have said, um, both for and against it, is valid. I do think that that we, we've got some we've got some time before we need to make that decision. I wouldn't say that it's necessary. I think it's a little premature for us to just cut it off at the head right now, not do the allocation before we know more about the project and its necessity. I know there's a lot of people uh, that have put a lot of effort into this. I wouldn't say. I know we've had some discussions. I, I don't know enough about what we're intending to do with the, with, with the remodel, how that ties in to, um, or what we're going to do to rehab it now, how does that tie into the remodel, uh, all the things that would come with this, uh, this project allocation, enough for me to say I'm either for or against it. Um, and I, I don't think I'm going to learn enough about it by the second reading to feel comfortable to say I'm either for or against it. So I think I'm okay with the allocation, uh, with the caveat of we, we still need to, uh, we still need more information before we move forward with the project. Um, but else, uh, Councilman Little? Uh, yeah, I agree with Councilman Perez. I reluctantly voted for this, but it was based on the condition that we were matching funds, not we were coming up with half a million dollars to initially fund the project. So uh, I will vote to allocate the funds, but I, I want a condition on us being, as, as council, approving it before the project starts. Okay. So, I mean, is that, is that direction? I mean, that's what we do up here is, is budget things, and we give staff a budget, and they go out and do it, and they bring it back. And So, 
I mean, if I'm if I'm staff, I'm sitting here saying, well, they think we got funds, but likely it could fail if it's brought back as is. So, uh, yeah, and, and maybe provide provide more info for the second reading. And what I don't want to do is everybody say, yeah, let's allocate it. Staff spends however long bidding it out, wasting a lot of time, and then come back and it fails five, two, four, three. I'm not saying which side I'm on. I'm just saying. I think as a governing body, we need to give them some direction before they spend too much time on it. Maybe we can do that um, with the memos and, and the documentation provided for the next meeting. I, I think that's a fair point. I mean, I think we can have a, a, a we can dovetail it with another agenda item uh, that continues this conversation to give a clear direction. Um, I don't think that, at least I don't feel comfortable that I know enough now to be able to get to provide the direction, which is why I don't want to just say we're not going to give the allocation because once all the information comes in, we may find that we're for it. Um, like I said, there's I, it's a um, uh, it, 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 there's a lot of gears turning and we don't know how everything's going to lock in. I would say the direction is just allow for the allocation um, as the project progresses. If we get into an allocation for what are we going to do with the, what are we going to move forward with design, uh, we can talk then. You know what is the budgetary. Uh, impact of the project. How does uh, donated funds come into place? What are we actually matching? All those things. I mean, I think there's a there's still a lot of opportunity for us to input before money is spent. Um, but I think it's too soon to say let's not move forward with it. Um, the alternative is we just we cut it off now when we put it to a future budgetary item. But we treat it more like a capital project. We approve moving forward. Uh, then we allocate design funds. Then we allocate um, con uh, construction cost, which is certainly a f fair way to move, uh, maneuver it, but right now we're not authorizing the expenditure of anything. We're just saying we're shifting funds from here to here for, for this potential purpose. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But, John, I, I, but I, I agree with Councilmember Carbone. I mean, we, we initially approved this to a sum up to this amount as matching funds. And now we're saying, well, we're not going to do ma matching funds. We're just going to put half a million dollars towards this project. Uh, that's what we're saying now. We're, we're saying that we're moving, so, we're moving the money over to be spent for this, but we're not saying that we're authorizing the expenditure of the money. We could say the money is over here to match, but we're not going to spend it until the match is available. If I could, uh, Mary Council, I think uh, Member Carbone's points are well taken. That uh, we'll we'll bring back some additional material with the uh, budget, the second reading, um, and we'll either have a separate agenda item at that time, or at a very soon council meeting uh, before we get too deep into this, and we'll have that discussion about whether because the intention was, and that was what was before he was to ask, you know, moving forward on this outside of uh, the match to stabilize the building. Uh, you know, as uh, as was described, but uh, we'll bring it to you in this second reading, and we'll bring some of the materials, but we won't move forward until we have a separate, specific discussion and direction on that, because that's that's not going to help any of us. And like you said, this does sound different than uh, uh, anything else that we do a budget amendment for, where we march off and get things done that you want us to. Uh, I don't think we have that kind of clarity, and we haven't provided enough at this point. So. Uh, We'll make that promise, and we'll do that that way. If, if that's you're okay with that, I'm sure. I thought that we had, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't we have we done some preliminary design on that? CC Lee had done that from the architectural <clears throat> stand side. Some very basic right. work. It's it was a preliminary budget was put together based on a review of the facility, but it's um, the next step ultimately with approval. Um, upon further direction would be to do you know the design work and then you'd come up with the total uh, total estimated budget and move forward with the appropriate contracts I think you know from our standpoint based on tonight's discussion we need to get you some additional information we'll provide that to you and then um, ultimately we'll, you'll let us know if you want to move forward with the project based on no additional funding that we have, or if you um, feel like there needs to be more discussion on how to move forward with the project. 
from from our perspective from my perspective and then I'd also like to talk about the advisory board um, there have been fundraising efforts and they've roughly come up with about ten thousand dollars worth of fundraising the facility is in a state of disrepair either at some point whether it's within the next six months or next year we're going to have to make a decision to renovate that facility if we don't it's no longer going to be there that's really kind of the bottom line long term so we need to decide if we want to renovate a city facility or not and that's what this would do yeah and that's that's the thing on there you know this the, the process we're going through right now is the same process that we do on all of our construction projects and design projects of coming in to allocate the funds in there and do the design. We've done preliminary design on stuff to come up with the cost estimate of what we're going to go through or not. So this is no different, really, to me, that, that what we've done. And if you look on, and, and I think I call them the mayor and Marcotte both, that uh, several years ago this came up, and the uh, dollar amount that was needed to come in there to do some work on the facility was 65000 And at that point, we helped it because we asked them to do uh, to do fundraiser on a 50% of it. And so we're back in the same thing again, but again, this is this is not coming out of anything other than a hot tax to do that. And, and if we wait another year, I mean, you can, you'll pay $30,000 to get it hauled off. And there goes the history. Yeah, and I would agree with, uh, I mean, if our CVB advisory board sees this as a viable project and thinks it's gonna be, you know, something as a, a future asset for the city moving forward and preservation of our history. I mean, I, I would love to see this move forward, um, you know, but I don't think that this is what we're discussing right now. I mean, to put the money aside to um, consider it later, I think is, is perfectly fine and valid. I'm not saying that it's um, a done deal by any means, but I, I, I think it's such an important part of the, the city's history and uh, to keep kicking the can down the road, eventually there's not going to be a can left to kick. So um, I'm with uh, Member Owens on this. Uh, switching gears to another item, uh, going back to the um, the replacement vehicles. So we do the six with the um, uh, with the reimbursement funds. Uh, we have 16 left. Uh, roughly what would be the schedule uh, in budgetary years for us to replace the remaining 16? Um, I think it depends on which way we go at mid-year. So I think what we would do is bring something for your discussion and early budget input uh, that would outline maybe a few different scenarios. Um, and then we would dump some money towards that at mid-year and then build something in the base for FY21. Um, that's not a great answer. But that's, that's kind of where we're I mean, if, we, if we adjust it for mid-year, maybe we buy a vehicle or two, possibly. Uh, so we knock it down to 14. So is the remainder 14 going to take three or four fiscal years for us to replace? Are we going to prioritize it? Or is the plan, is there any kind of urgent uh, budgetary discussion as to whether we're going to want to plan to um, to knock this out in the next fiscal year? Uh, what I'm getting to is do we want to take a, uh, take a bigger chunk out of this with the allocations um, rather than six, maybe we do 10 or 12 and be able to be able to get all these re vehicles replaced and within a next fiscal year or two cycle? So for comparison's sake, uh, FY20, we'd have five replacements. So if you follow that, it'd be roughly three fiscal years to, to take out the 16 here. If we continue on that path, we were. Okay. <clears throat> um, maybe just for my edification, just clarify that as a kind of reading, because I may want to discuss if whether reallocating to take a bigger chunk out of that with these allocations um, and the, on the second reading. Where do you want to get the money from? Um, I think it, it's how we spend the 1.6. So would we be moving money from uh, streets and sidewalks over to buy more vehicles, um, any any of the items that are within the 1.6? So I'm not moving any from, from any other funds. It's just how we're allocating the 1.6. At least that's what I'm that's what I'm discussing is do we prioritize more of the 1.6 that we would get from reimbursement towards buying more vehicles. Or do we want to allocate for the suggestion that uh, that staff has had? It seemed like when you go back to the process, say we approve this tonight, you have to take each one of those elements that you have on the, on the screen and that you just brought up as, as a contribution from last year's budget to this next year's budget 
you're going to have to go through the same audit process to, uh, to, to make that transfer, to, to bring the budget up to the point where it could be audited by, a, uh, by our auditing process, our auditor. So I suspect a lot. Do you feel that some of these items that we're discussing are, can be caught in that process? You might have just had a slip on one or two or something. Some of the FEMA items you're talking about? Yeah, when you when you when yeah when you finalize the the, the budget process to bring us, we well, say now the budget today is sure. whatever it is. Sure. So there's still a lot of work our our friends in accounting are doing to get that audit done. So if you're talking about the amount over policy we're projecting here, that 2.9, yeah, the yes, ones that are, that are of concern there, yes. So I expect that to change. I don't expect it to change enough where we would have to drop anything out of the budget. It would just be less that we allocate at me. You, you, you don't think that your numbers would change any at all? And I think they will change. I, I don't that, think That's what I was saying is that they'll probably change and uh, catch up with the concerns that have been expressed. Perhaps, I don't know. Within the realm of possibility. Since I'm not an auditor. Council, have any other question or comment? Anybody want to chip in at this point some more? <clears throat> Madam Secretary, I guess we, I believe we have a motion second on the floor. We'll find out. Whoops. Council Member Little, have Power you voted? Up. Are we putting any, any, any conditions on this, or are you just going to come back with um, second reading and some revisions? We'll yeah, provide this additional is, information at the, the second reading. Um, and uh, you've got, like we said, we're not going to spend the FEMA money until we've got it in the bank. We won't go forward on uh, obligating the city for the uh, depot until we have a separate discussion on that. Maybe. Aye. Did you vote aye? Yes. OK. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Perez? Aye. Councilmember Owens? Aye. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Motion passes six to zero. With Councilmember Hernandez absent from the chamber. Moving in our agenda to item number three, which is Hernandez, but I believe he stepped out the door. Item number three. I'll take it, Mayor. Consideration possible action resolution number R2019-295, so moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. So the uh, TERS process requires uh, many different decision points uh, by different bodies. Uh, the council uh, has to, the responsibilities for reviewing and approving these uh, letters of financing agreement uh, that uh, uh, after the budget's amended, um, it, that uh, these are required as well. These uh, three that are before you are for three of our city projects, uh, public improvements within the TERS boundaries. Um, that's fire station number eight, uh, Shadow Creek Lib Public Library, and then the Nature Trail connections. So uh, these are amendments to those and uh, uh, moving those three Im improvement projects uh, forward so that uh, they'll be fully eligible for the anticipated costs uh, reimbursement from the TERS district proceeds. Okay, does council have any question or comment on staff report? I don't believe I hear anybody that's interested. Just had a motion. Adam Secretary, I believe we have a motion second for item three. Thank you. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Perez? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little. Aye. Motion passes six to zero with Council Member Hernandez absent from the chambers. Okay. Moving to item four. Moving to item four, Hernandez. Mayor, consideration possible action resolution number R2019 283, so moved. Second. Second. <clears throat> I have a motion. Yeah, I hear a second on that. We have a motion, second on the floor. Cap staff report. Thanks, sir. Uh, the city entered into an uh, agreement with the architectural firm uh, PGAL 
uh, for architectural design services for our new uh, Shadow Creek Library. Uh, the libraries uh, in Brazoria County are built by the hosting uh, communities, uh, but then operated by Brazoria County. So uh, the construction is uh, a city responsibility. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, we're in a position where uh, we can get this uh, second library replacement for the uh, store shop uh, existing facility on Business Center Drive uh, con uh, constructed under the TERS. Um, we've, uh, as part of the design process, been through that. Uh, there was, there's been considerable interest, uh, I think even at the council table, for getting as much uh, uh, community space and meeting space uh, as possible. It always seems to come up as a need. Um, so we've taken that and uh, that's uh, being uh, incorporated uh, and uh, uh, part of the design. Uh, so we're able to, to get uh, a teaching theater similar to what exists at uh, Turner High School. Um, then also uh, additional large meeting spaces um, above and beyond, you know, even what we have across the street here at the Tom Reed Library. Uh, so that was uh, one uh, change element. And then also uh, through this process, we identified an opportunity uh, to get uh, Brazoria County. They have existing space for their tax office over at the Public Safety Building on uh, Cullen. Uh, by moving it over into this uh, additional public building, uh, uh, they will be able to serve uh, the population there much uh, more conveniently. Um, and it also frees up future space within our Public Safety Building. Uh, so we see this as a big win-win. Uh, um, Brazoria County would be, uh, they've already uh, budgeted for and will be helping us with the, uh, uh, some of the interim financing. Uh, but, uh, you know, this would be space provided for this public use under the TERS in the library. And so, uh, all told, the, the additions to the then designs from when we initially uh, started off in this process, it's about uh, a 30% addition to the building uh, can all be accomplished on this site. And so, uh, with that, there's a uh, commensurate uh, design fees, uh, you know, programming. I believe this represents about 23% uh, uh, increase uh, in recognition of that. And so this is the necessary design to be able to keep us moving forward on this uh, project as it's been amended. Nothing to add. No. Council, have any question or comment on the staff report? Did you, you have any comments? Yeah, I've always got a comment. Um, yeah, I guess uh, GL is here uh, on there. Um, and, and really, you know, uh, my first comment was a 100-seat facility, and there I thought was pretty extensive. Uh, I know Turner's got one. Are we going to have an elevated stage and all of that on there? You know, if, if you come in and, and you look at uh, the cost of that, and probably if you come in and put item line item five over here, or the agenda number five into it, you look at uh, twenty three thousand or twenty three million five hundred thousand dollars for the library on thirty nine thousand square feet. Um, that gives you a tall cost of uh, six hundred and two dollars a square foot. That just seems like that's pretty expensive to me. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe not. So I, I don't build libraries. Well, just just on a square footage basis, uh, I appreciate you'd asked about that earlier. I mean, our calculations we're looking at uh, like four hundred dollars a square foot, and this is still early stage. The next item is to get into the CMAR. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, you know, we're looking at you know just rough numbers at this early stage, like four hundred dollars. Four twenty-five uh, is what on that basis for the construction. Yeah, well, if you add what we got in here right now, that's looking at maybe something change on this as we go through. But that's uh, you know we got twenty-three million five hundred thousand in there for the library, and with what we're doing now with PJL, we're just spending out thirty-nine thousand square feet on there. So if you you know do the numbers, it still comes out to six oh two. Now, there may be some adjustments through there to uh, uh, do to that in order to uh, to get it a little bit lower, but that just seems. And one other thing uh, on there, how much is the county putting into this project? 
Well, again, it's, it's funded by the TERS, so they're not putting uh, any m money into it any more than we are, other than the interim financing. So we had approached them, and uh, you know, they they you know at that stage when it was uh, just on square footage, asked them to float a uh, million dollars, which is what they budgeted. So that's what uh, they would get reimbursed, just like we will uh, when it's done. So nobody's neither the city nor the county's quote unquote, you know, it's it's money from the TERS, uh, not from our ultimately from our general funds. Yeah, I, I understand that. Okay. Mm. Any other question that come from, from council? The only thing I'd add is that, you know, the uh, uh, architectural services, uh, which we've awarded, uh, you know, this amendment, again, staff's, uh, you know, reviewed that and, and their work effort and will continue to, you know, review their hours put in on the project and it's uh, in line. I mean, the original, I believe, uh, uh, or the design, you know, looking at maybe seven to nine percent of the construction costs, and so uh, you know, it's it's less proportional than what we originally awarded. So, uh, uh, thanks for that clarification, Clay. I think I had um, I'd mentioned I'd mentioned when the uh, the original award came out. You know, I think um, the value of the contract, the design services, is on the high end. Um, as I said before, I expect that everything to be tight, and that we're not we don't have any RFIs or change orders of significance uh, when we get into construction. Uh, certainly, the CMR will help with that, but uh, that's my expectation. Um, uh, I, I've talked to staff. I think uh, we're going to keep a careful eye on the man hours to make sure that the project, um, uh, the man hours are appropriate for the effort, and the effort is uh, and the and the charges are appropriate for um, the design that we're getting. I trust that they're going to uh, they're going to keep an eye on it. Um, I'm, in general, I'm concerned with the value of the design, uh, but I'm um, I'm trusting staff and also ask to be informed about as uh, get more information as the project progresses, so I can take a look at the numbers to ensure that the um, uh, the project is meeting um, what I think are the standards set for this kind of uh, design. Um, it's a very expensive building to. To design thus far, um, this is not a cheap design. And uh, you know, being in the industry, I've I've, I've been a part of a number of um, uh, public projects uh, that are of more significant scope. Uh, I think technology-wise, uh, MEP-wise, uh, civil-wise, certainly uh, have um, uh, more design, um, uh, more more challenges to the design. Uh, and then have not made this value. So um, I'm hoping uh, that where the man hours can be cut, they'll be cut. I'm hoping that uh, we'll see the value in the design when uh, when it comes to us and it gets into construction. Is there not a cheaper design that we can do? I mean, $23.5 million is an expensive building for a library. I, I don't know that that's the best use of some of the TERS money, I mean, there's so much more we could do, uh, so many other projects that we could do with, with that money. I'm not against the library. I think we need the library. But, I mean, $23.5 million is pretty steep. And I'm looking at, you know, the design on here, and it's a very fancy building. Um, I mean, do we need to have a library that that, that uh, type of structure? I mean, yes. One of the things that uh, I don't know whether it uh, shows in the wording here or not, but if you read that, I believe we're going to take move the uh, county tax office from the public safety building over to this facility, if I'm not wrong, which means that uh, it's going to help uh, both the tax facility office as well as the uh, Missouri County libraries They're at both at the same time. I guess a $12 million animal shelter That's is nothing compared to $23.5 million for another building. Yeah. This was discussed at the um, TERS 2 annual meeting, and uh, they felt it was something that uh, they felt, if you're going to build it, let's make it nice because it's going to be in the uh, acts of the Shadow Creek Ranch, Turs 2 area, and they want to make sure that they have 
uh, you can solve the problems of uh, share for the quality of uh, the development for the people out there. Because it would be in an area where it's going to be most a bunch of other attractive facilities, so it, uh, it needs to shine out. Council, had any question or comments? Yeah, Mayor, I calculated it to be $653 a square foot, um, which is right up there with the animal shelter. It seems like, I guess, that's the new benchmark for buildings in Airland. They've got to be over $600 a square foot. <coughs> when mm -hmm. I talk to contractors, they can't believe it. Um, they said we can build hospitals for $350 a square feet. Um, I don't know. It just seems like an excessive amount of money to me. Any further comments? From yeah, just a, just a quick comment. I, I think that there, there is some sticker shock associated with the number, uh, but just when we're talking about any of these specialized facilities like libraries or the animal shelter, I, I think really the important number to know is the comps of other communities that are doing it versus just the raw number, because I, I think the really the only metric that all of us are comparing this to mentally, I mean, you just throw out hospitals, but for the most part, you're thinking, what's the square footage of my home, which of course is gonna be different. So I, I couldn't tell you if it's high or low because I'm, I'm not familiar with the industry standard, but I, I think that would be kind of helpful in a lot of these discussions if we could see what other communities are doing this for on a square footage basis. Okay. Uh, you know, what I would suggest is we go through the design process, certainly we're going through a wish list, we're throwing everything on there and, and that we have, an, uh, we have a, a cap value based on what was a, an approved appropriation. Uh, that's not to say it's the final answer. Um, what we can get is the design, uh, get the CMR to try and um, pull out uh, uh, any uh, anything in the design that doesn't necessarily need to be there as what the CMR process should, um, uh, should do. Uh, once we get the design in, we start getting some early, um, uh, early estimates on what we think the construction cost to be. Um, you know, we can start. We can start setting the budget down from there. We can start talking to the design team. Certainly, it would cost us more in the design to start being things uh, down uh, to get to a more a budget number that we think is more commensurate to uh, the facility we're adding. Um, so, I think there's still work for us to do. I, I hate to. I, I'm I'm equally challenged by the the value of this library right now. And this has been a project that I prioritize since I've been on council. I want this hat library to happen, but I also want to be uh, careful about the number and making sure that if we're spending this money that we're seeing the value. Um, right now, I'm not there yet. Um, and I would say I'm the greatest champion for this, uh, for this project, um, or has been the greatest champion for the project. I want the design process to go through, um, let our project staff, uh, work through the project, through the program that they, uh, they've they envisioned, uh, through community outreach, through our other partners in here, um, get the estimate, and once we get the estimate, before we go out to bid, see if that's something that we're gonna be comfortable with. I think that's gonna be a process that makes us a little bit more comfortable. If we come in and it says, hey, it's gonna be 21 million, and we're not comfortable spending 21 million, and then we set a value and start talking about um, a value engineering things that we may not necessarily want to spend on, that may not be a priority for the area. So I'm hoping that that's not going to be the case. I'm hoping that um, we spend as much as we as much as we are on the design that all the value is going to be built into the design. Um, again, for the level of effort that we're uh, that we're putting in design uh, financially, I, I expect that we're gonna we're gonna have a good list of VE items that we can immediately uh, incorporate in uh, into the project uh, to um, satisfy some of the concerns of council. Um, I, I just don't, I don't, I'm reticent to start chopping the project now. I want to see the whole thing through, uh, but I'm not comfortable yet based on the value that we're getting on, um, on moving forward with the, um, uh, with the construction of the cost that we have right now, uh, unless I see more value. Did we get one of y'all representatives here, PGA, to come up to the podium? Council, if I may, um, while the budget is established at $23.5 million, uh, that includes a lot of things other than the construction of the building. Of course, it includes the design. It includes uh, some project contingency uh, from the when we originally started this project to ensure that, that inflation or tariffs or any of those things did not put us in a position to where we had to go get additional authorization to build the project or additional authorization, authorization from the TERS. 
It also includes a healthy uh, FF&E budget, $2.2 million, because when we um, build or expand libraries, um, it's the city's responsibility to provide the initial circulation, and that's part of that cost as well. So if you look at the actual construction number in the budget, it's a little bit south of $18 million, and we're really shooting for less than that as we work through the CMAR process. So um, just wanted to go through the budget and kind of clarify what all those different pieces are and what we truly are talking about from a construction cost standpoint. Thank you. While you're coming up, and I'll just I'll respond to what Mr. Uh, uh, Epperson said. I think um, I appreciate that clarification. I, I really um, have a lot of faith and trust in our project management staff to, to, to bring us value. Uh, like I said, as we develop the process, I think we're going to all be keeping an eye on it. So. Um, as y'all develop documents, we want to be able to see that value. Oh, absolutely. Jeff Bulla with the PGAL. I'm a principal with PGAL. Yeah. Jeff, I was going to go over the uh, information here and the basic services and, and the extension on there, but uh, reimbursement of expenses, I guess, for the original amount, then when we come in and added the other, they jumped up another $6,000 for uh, the services. On there, and additional yes, services that is, that is forty-two thousand. The, the additional services is ex specifically related to an additional consultant that's being added into these fees. Right. With the addition of the teaching theater and the uh, uh, more focus on the meeting rooms, we've added a specialty acoustical consultant and an audiovisual um, and IT consultant for those spaces, and those uh, expenses are related to them. So a large portion of this increase or not a large, but a, a portion of this increase is related specifically to that program. The uh, the cost per square foot budget that we're aiming for is for the cost of the construction is $425 a square foot. Uh, we are working on projects with the, right now, library projects that are very comparable to this with the city of Round Rock, uh, Dripping Springs, Cedar Hill, um, and San Marcos. And this is right in the same range exactly that we're working with them for budgets for comparable peer cities. Yeah, and I guess looking at this, and of course, this is coming up the next item on here on that number five with spa glass on there. But if you're coming up with the cost of, of what it is for uh, the total amount of the project, you would add that in to CMRA as a part of that with also the uh, construction cost and the design cost. And that's where, you know, when I looked at it today, uh, it was coming up quite, quite expensive. It, it, on is there. A, and, it is uh, a large project, yes, sir. Yeah, and and I know PGL from years when we started, you know, when y'all started, too, there were Jack and all of them to, to do that. But, you know, and I know that y'all do quite a bit of this work all, yes, all across, you know, Texas, and we even worked on one together in LaGuardia. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that, uh, it just seemed like it was very extensive, and this is no different than what we've done the other is appropriating the money up to that point to be able to use up here. And I know that, uh, Trent, what you were saying on there is, of course, also that, you know, we're going to see about cutting it, but, you know, the, the I think uh, the outside uh, contingencies in, in uh, FF&E was something like $1.4 million. Uh, that was in the, the dollar figure that I saw on there. But still, you know, I just feel like, you know, it's, it's a lot, and I'm, you know, as Council Member Perez was talking about, of, of looking at this as we go on. But if you're saying that, that uh, you're looking at now uh, maybe around the 406 or whatever the number is on we're, there. We're trying to bring the project in not to exceed. Our, our recommendation to the city is that we could bring the project in around four or not, not to exceed $425 uh, per square foot of heated area. So that's in the ballpark of the other ones that you're doing now? Yes, sir. We're doing a 65,000 square foot three-story project for the city of Round Rock. It's slightly less than that because of the, it's a lot larger project the economy of scales, but we are using the same budget numbers right now in uh, Dripping Springs, uh, uh, Cedar Hill. Um, the, the San Marcos project is an addition, so that's a little harder to, to uh, evaluate. But yeah, these are all the, it's kind, of, it's kind of the rate that these libraries are being built at right now. Is that, um, is that something, are those other libraries, are they, are they using CMAR? Uh, the Round Rock Library is not. Um, Dripping Springs is uh, likely going to. Um, right now we're doing a study phase for them, and so they're 
more of a feasibility and a conceptual design, and so that's to be determined. And the Dripping Springs uh, Library, that is their, this is their budget. We just, uh, in the process of signing, excuse me, Cedar Hill, we're in the process of signing a contract with them right now for a, about a 48,000 square foot project, but their budget is based on this, a similar number. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, thank you. And I might add, I think it would be interesting <coughs> to know is that we, we have had extensive uh, meetings with uh, Spa Glass. They've been generous with their time, even knowing that you guys haven't yet approved their contract. Uh, they've been generous in the last couple of weeks or more with their time actually doing an initial estimate for us. And we've had extensive value engineering discussions with them on all components of the of the city, of the project. We completed a schematic design that is pretty in depth and actually has framing, steel framing plans, foundation plans, uh, and a, a pretty extensive MEP narrative. And so they have quite a lot to go on at this point and they've given some good feedback. As a matter of fact, we were meeting with the city this afternoon uh, and the staff going through a number of uh, items to create the value that you deserve. Good, thank you. Thank you. I was looking through here, uh, it says that the portion of the project attributed to, or attributable to the county tax office will be pre-financed by Missouri County. Do, well, I couldn't find the percentage, do we just know? I mean, just offhand. No, again, we uh, we had a square footage and, and uh, based on a number we and the county needs them for budgeting, so we said a million dollars. So that's what uh, they budget, and that's what It'd be a million dollars off of these numbers that we're discussing. Is that from? Again, this just that's just for the financing. For the, but this is all. I mean, as you said, like interim financing, basically. Anyway, so correct. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, and that's what like a four, five year reimbursement period, something like that. Uh, projections from the TERS is uh, probably yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Something like that. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I would just add, you know, I I know Jesse Gonzalez, who uh, was with Spa Glass for what, 34 years. I mean, I I know that they're a reputable company. I, I think that they're operating the way that I know Jesse's reputation would uh, would lead me to believe. Uh, in that um, uh, in that sense of um, uh, of everybody working together cooperatively, like this, to just start preemptively thinking about some value engineering items, um, start. Targeting as we as we progress this project, um, if we start getting to values that are in excess of what um, what may be projected, or uh, honestly, what we may be willing to spend, that we have some items uh, readily available um, that we don't have a whole lot of additional effort to pay for to to try and go back and look for VE items. I think they should be for the value that we're paying uh, on on the design. I think that should be that should be readily available when we come up for contract. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Uh, I, I would just like to say I, I wasn't questioning the cost of the design fee. I think we we changed the design and added uh, quite a bit more space. So obviously your fees are going to go up. And um, from what I read on reasonable architectural fees, you're within that range um, based on the, the total amount that you're projecting that it will cost. If it ends up costing twenty-two million, then you're probably <coughs> at the low end of the range. So, just wanted to make that clear. I appreciate that. It's not going to cost twenty-two million for the cost of work. It will not. Not that we're talking construction costs is what we're speaking of. Right. Um, I understand you have a project budget, but the cost of work of the construction will not be that. And my comment should be very basic. When we go through design, can we make sure that we hit all the city regulations with? trees and open space and everything that we'd make a business do we make sure that we follow our own rules and Which make sure that our fire suppression system is in so now it does cost 22 million <laughs> you know that's a great point uh, we took the city's uh, arborist out to the site as a design team with our landscape architect and have literally walked around and looked at all of the principal trees to find out what's important to the city and to the community in the shadow creek ranch uh, to make sure that we we deliver those trees uh, in healthy condition. Yeah, absolutely. It's a beautiful site. All right. Any other question or comment by council? Madam Secretary, I believe we got a motion second here on item four. Thank you. Council Member Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Council Member Moore? The mayor made my vote for me, so yes. Yeah. Council Member Perez? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little? 
since we're only voting on the fees for the architect, I motion passes seven to zero. Okay, moving in our agenda, the new business item five. House Member Perez, would you present this for our consideration? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration of positive action resolution number R 2019 293. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council. As uh, was uh, described in, in uh, great detail, uh, we've been through a process with this construction manager at risk for our new uh, Westside Pearland Public Library. Uh, we've uh, got a number of uh, proposals and reviewed those uh, very aggressively uh, and uh, I've come to you with a recommendation for spa glass. Uh, this would get that uh, uh, ball more than rolling to engage with spa glass uh, for that CMAR process. Uh, they have extensive experience uh, of the scale and complexity that's necessary for this project. Um, and as was just noted with the other item, they've already uh, engaged with uh, staff and the architect to uh, provide some early looks and thinking, uh, but this would uh, uh, bring them alongside us for this project on a, a very beautiful, uh, efficient, effective uh, library there that'll stand the test of time and be a great addition. Um, you know, I don't want to retread the uh, need for the project and, and uh, uh, what this all entails, but this will definitely, on the land that was designated as part of the Shadow Creek uh, master plan, uh, uh, for public purposes, give us that uh, opportunity to build this library uh, there on the north side of Shadow Creek. So uh, we're looking forward to this uh, process and, and uh, engage now with Spa Glass and PGAL, we'll have the team assembled to uh, uh, bring this to fruition. Council, have any question or comment based on this staff report on this item? Ready? PG, I mean, uh, Spa Glass. Can we have somebody up the podium? Um, Roger Berry with Spa Glass Construction, Vice President of Operations. Good. Yeah, and you know, this before we give out contracts, if nobody's here with the firm that's going to get the contract, then we delay the contract. But I, I knew you were here though, but uh, on there, but yeah, I guess uh, Trent and I go back for the number of years with Spall Glass, and when Jesse was there uh, on there, and so that brings a lot more on. But uh, it looks like that y'all are pretty tight on your number. I mean, uh, and I guess it's what a three percent uh, on there a total of uh, of that on the basic services and the uh, and the fees and stuff. It seems like it's a pretty tight number. And uh, what projects do y'all have ongoing now that uh, can improve this, like the library or something like that? Uh, we've probably got about twenty projects going on currently uh, for twenty nineteen, from healthcare at Ben Tob to Methodist to. Uh, a new library for the city of Houston, Westbury Library. Uh, we're working on uh, senior living projects in Rice University, uh, a pretty diverse group. Uh, we've got a civil division that's also doing about a three mile stretch of uh, FM 249 on the north side of town. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, uh, brings us to the table is we've got a lot of experience in pricing based on the, the types of project that we do. and, and uh, not only do we do CM at risk work, we also do hard bid work, so we're, we're in tune with what the current market pricing is today. Okay, good. That, uh, that was what I was hoping you would uh, come out with on there, the activity that y'all currently doing across, not only here in the Houston area, but outside of Houston area. So, but uh, I know that you've been working with PJL on this. Do you see anything possibly that we may want to look at it in detail or, or what? Uh, yes, sir, there is. We've offered some uh, some value engineering options today, and we'll price uh, any option that uh, somebody may come up with for the uh, decision of the city to accept or reject as part of the design or construction. Okay. So on this CMR, you all got uh, staff that's uh, not working on the other projects that's uh, able to work with us on this one? Yes, sir. We have the dedicated staff uh, uh, that uh, worked <clears throat> on it through estimating, through our uh, a construction 
Uh, we've got a uh, construction manager dedicated to pre-construction services. We've also got our, our project manager, Justin Nowak, here tonight, who is also working as part of the job to get him plugged in early in pre-construction so he knows what's going on in the construction phase. All right, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, just to reiterate what I asked uh, PJL uh, on the other side of the coin, y'all are comfortable working with them as uh, apparently y'all already have about identifying potential or, uh, small and, and major BE items uh, that can help us um, have some options for keeping the price down for the project. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question or comments? Okay. Do you have any idea off the top of your head what the uh, cost per square foot for construction of the Houston library is? No, sir, no. We've just started mm -hmm. that and not, not sure what it's going to end up just yet. We're still in design right now. Is um, you know, there's a lot of glass exposed on the proposed uh, drawing. Uh, is that a pretty high tempered uh, glass? I mean, it's not just uh, it's not glass. It's really a, a more of a uh, metallic glass, isn't it? I'm not. Sure. How would you how would you describe that glass? Because uh, which I'm sure that. You know, I think the main component of the glass today is based on a hurricane rating, uh, just uh -huh. to make sure that we get the uh, the strength required for this particular zone in wind rating, in addition to determine if the glass needs to be impact resistant or not. Uh, there's a lot of films and colors of the glass, and I don't know that the glass itself has been selected Previous yet, uh, but uh, uh, I'm sure samples will be submitted for, uh, for city approval. Yeah, okay. Any other question or comment from council? Yeah, I guess the comment, we're, from this side, we're trying to lower the price, but um, you get paid a 3% of the larger the project, the more you get paid, correct? We get paid 3% based on the cost of the work. Right. So, I mean, that's, we're going to say here, let's cut it, let's cut it, but that's, I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that when it comes back. And I guess um, on the, the prior award, if we if we start monkeying and cutting too much stuff, then we're going to be approving another amendment to PGAL to pay them more money to cut stuff. So. Well, I I think what based on the discussion that we just had, they're 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 willing to to go through the VE items preemptively and have us a menu of, of value engineering items that we can we can look at when we're talking about moving forward the the award um, with respect to um, the value of the project. Which I like I do a number of public projects. Um, I think um, I trust PJL and Spa Glass to operate um, uh, as as I co my company would operate, and the other companies I work with would operate. And that you find the value, and then if it means that you take a little less on the project, then you're still working for the best interest of the client. Um, it's not unusual in this industry, though it seems seems unusual. Uh, that is that is not atypical. You find the value, and then uh, the, the the end of the the end of the contract means that you adjust the uh, adjust the fees. Um, I also have a lot of faith in our uh, project staff. They, they're pretty experienced. They know what they're doing. They know how to find value where uh, where it needs to be found. So I think we're in good hands. I think by virtue of uh, provide, um, uh, borrowing your term for from earlier, uh, providing direction as to what our expectations are, um, I'm, I believe everybody's highly motivated to ensure that those um, uh, that those directions are followed. I guess to follow up on the all the glass, I know the school district's going through a big um, safety and security in terms of coatings to put on glass. So I guess at some point, if we can um, at least have that discussion, um, if we're going to do anything, I know bullet resistant and going to be cost effective, but um, I don't know with where we're headed out to, in today's environment and knowing that the school district is going back and hardening the schools. Um, we want to have a 100% glass facade that at least let's have the discussion through the design phase. I know it's pretty and everything, but does it really make sense with hurricanes and, and security issues? I can't answer that, and I don't, we don't need to answer it now, but at least have that, take that into consideration. Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't, I, I would say that that's a great, that's a great answer, or that's a great uh, comment. It particularly, 
long-term maintenance, uh, it, we may be able to get the, volume, the, the value of the construction down, but if we're looking at a, a glass-clad building that's uh, that significant glass-clad building, the, um, the cost of the HVAC goes up quite a bit. Um, so just, again, another BE item to consider. So if we're quiet, any other comment from council? Just Madam Secretary, I believe we've got a motion second on the floor here. Councilmember Perez, how do you vote? Aye. Councilmember Owens? Aye. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Little? Aye. Councilmember Hernandez? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Thank you, sir. Good. Moving into our agenda, item number six, and uh, Councilmember Perez is uh, going to uh, in, in office, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I believe. In the, no, I'm not reading this one. Uh, in the best interest of the city, I think it's important for me to know for the public record, while I've not uh, received any um, uh, any money for this uh, project or I'm under contract for the project, I did advise uh, uh, the applicants early on before they were negotiating with the city uh, about direction. I think in fairness to the citizens, uh, it's uh, better for me to recuse myself thank and you. step out of the chamber for this discussion, which I will do now. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Owens, I want you to present this after we have a speaker at this point. After you what? Go ahead and introduce oh, Okay. Uh, Consideration possible action resolution number R2019-296. That's a move. Second. We have a motion to second on the floor. Mayor, we have one uh, person that would like to speak on this item. He's kind of new to City Council, um, Mr. Alan Mueller. There he Please is. Give us your address. <laughs> it's me again. Uh, Alan Mueller, 4201 Broadway here in Pearland, excuse me, um, here tonight on behalf of uh, Dr. Menon and the Menon Enclave uh, project. Uh, we were here back in uh, April, you may recall, talking about um, how to get sanitary sewer extended to the, the project that Dr. Menon wants to do uh, adjacent to the temple uh, off of McLean and Amy Lane. <clears throat> that was at a time when uh, you, uh, we were kind of still learning about the uh, new annexation laws, and so um, you wanted to make sure that whatever you did in this particular case kind of fit with your overall policy for utility extensions. Uh, so you all worked on that and that was approved, that new policy was approved in June of this year. And so since that time, we've been working with the uh, city attorney's office on uh, developing this agreement uh, that uh, conforms to that policy. So we've been uh, happy to be your, your guinea pig in that process. Uh, but I think uh, this agreement is it's mutually beneficial. Um, uh, it, it follows the policy, uh, Dr. Menon or the, and the property owner association that he will create, uh, will fund the lift station and the force main along Amy Lane. They'll also take over maintenance responsibility for a portion of the existing McLean, uh, uh, lane, uh, McLean line, excuse me. Um, the, uh, residents there will, uh, pay the out of district or out of city rates for impact fees and water and sewer fees. And so I think from a financial perspective, city has no obligations and it's a revenue generator for you in the long run. Uh, and we think it's going to create a great little community there that's going to be good for the whole Pearland community that, uh, again, uh, benefits and serves the, uh, the temple population in that area. So uh, with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Let's move to staff report at this point. Experience Council, this is a uh, resolution for um, area to come into the city and us to provide uh, water sewer services. Uh, this does uh, follow a new uh, uh, policy that we had implemented. Uh, the property is not contiguous to the city, so uh, this would be a way that they could uh, uh, serve that property at their expense um, and uh, uh, be in a position uh, through some uh, good thinking and looking ahead out of our uh, city attorney's office in a position to come into the city when it is contiguous and appropriate. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, this does uh, get them that, that service level uh, and protects the city's interest in terms of uh, our system and uh, maintenance of that. Uh, so uh, really is a win-win and uh, sets a standard for how we can uh, look at these areas for these kinds of unique cases uh, where the property is in our ETJ, but not not quite ripe for uh, voluntary annexation. So I uh, recommend your consideration of this and going forward. Okay. 
Council, have any question or comment on this uh, based on staff report and also the witness that we just heard from? Council Cohen? Yeah, I'd just like to thank staff for working through this. I think the initial answer was no, we don't want to, but um, I, I think it makes sense uh, with the increased rates. And um, anyway, I know it wasn't <clears throat> the thing to do, but I appreciate staff working through it. Mm hmm Any other question or comment on this item? I think it's one that uh, uh, is a good example of how we could uh, implement the motion and action of the council to in situations such as this. But at some point, as he becomes uh, in proximity to our, uh, to our boundaries, uh, the, the property would be annexed into the city. And that's a, near, a very fertile area out there for potential annexation because of the quality of the, uh, of the area, because that's where the Manashi Temple is a little further down. And uh, uh, I think that uh, as it grows, that's a lot of open space down there that would be very fruitful for us to have such quality uh, uh, as individuals as Dr. Manon and uh, to be able to uh, work and use this as a good example of, of the process that we have proved and work. So I think it's a great idea. Any question from City Council at this point? Madam Secretary, I believe we've got a motion second on the floor. Council Member Owens, how do you vote? Aye. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Motion passes six to zero with Council Member Perez absent from the chambers. Moving in our agenda to item number seven, Council Member Orlando. Consideration of possible action. Uh, first reading of ordinance number 1587, so moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. Thanks, sir. This is a uh, first reading for a, a, a total rewrite of uh, uh, Chapter 29 of our Code of Ordinances relating to uh, traffic. Uh, really helps uh, streamline and modernize and clarify uh, the various regulations. Uh, eliminates a lot of chaff that uh, uh, was either obsolete or already uh, in uh, state codes and not necessary for us locally. Uh, did try to preserve uh, the, the local provisions that are uh, appropriate for this day and age, uh, you know, there's everything from how, uh, you know, just parking and other kinds of offenses and the citations and uh, bringing that up to, uh, uh, to, to 2019 standards and going forward. So uh, our uh, legal department and uh, uh, police department have worked very hard on this and recommend your consideration so we can move forward and get this into place. Sure. Nothing to add, sir. Council, have any question or comment on staff report? We've regulated in roller skates. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> roller skates and peeling out. I think it's time to change. Digging. <laughs> okay. Any comments from council at this point? Hearing none, Madam Secretary, I believe we have a motion second on the floor here. Council Member Orlando, how do you vote? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Perez? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. <clears throat> Moving at our agenda to item number eight, Council Member Carbone, would you place this on the table for us? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration of possible action, resolution R 2019-297, so moved. Second. second. Motion is second on staff report. I'll really turn this over to council. This is uh, the next three items are uh, uh, yours. Uh, the council did vote and make nominations. And so uh, with the city's allocation of votes, uh, larger portions in, in Missouri County, really negligible in Fort Bend and Harris, but still required. Uh, and uh, you, you can choose from the uh, uh, nominations that you made, presumably you'd uh, uh, cast those for the folks that you asked to be put on the nominations, but 
uh, these next three are all the council's uh, prerogative. So, sure. Mayor, I make a motion that we cast all our votes to George Sanders. Second. Second. Okay, we have motion second. Can I just offer a? Comment, and I already uh, spoke to uh, Darren about this, but in the future, while I, I did do some research on these uh, uh, nominees, and I feel comfortable tonight voting for uh, Mr. Sanders, uh, just in the future, whatever additional information we can uh, provide in the packets for the candidates, uh, whether we get that independently or from the um, uh, counties themselves, would be greatly appreciated. I'd ask uh, just so we meet that expectation. I don't know what we can or should do and how much staff time you want us to dedicate to that because uh, these are really the county's nominations. We, we wouldn't have any way of, we'd have to go out and do our own research that's even possible for some of these, so. Sure, I mean, even if it's just a simple ask of the county to provide additional information, we appreciate and, that. And to add on there, just something I would appreciate. I, I wasn't aware, I know we did this a couple of weeks ago when we were, um, we had the opportunity to make nominations, but I wasn't aware that we were going to have that opportunity until the, the Thursday packet before. So um, maybe part of it is is also just uh, having a longer lead time to give us the opportunity to vet candidates uh, and you know ask someone to to throw their hat in the ring. This can be your heads up. We do this every year. So it's annual basis. I'm glad you're back. Um, <laughs> Appreciate I'm it. I, I'm, I'm sure uh, there's going to be other It'll, there's other entities and boards that have very various <laughs> terms. So maybe for new council members, we could get a sheet together. That'd be helpful for them. Thanks. And, and just to clarify, it is a, they serve two year terms, so we uh, it will be uh, every two years. Uh, there you I'm go, might, Tony. Got to got to get it written down. <laughs> I might uh, remind you that uh, the, uh, the, our, the predecessor to. Uh, Mr. Sanders was Joe Knight, and uh, they had worked together on on the uh, appraisal areas. And uh, uh, Sanders was also on the board of directors of the Economic Carolina Economic Corporation, and uh, so he's a uh, well well schooled in in uh, Paraland's need for appropriate attention when it comes to a property appraisal. And I would recommend him as a Quality person. Matter of fact, I hate to uh, just a point of interest. Uh, he and I served uh, on the same floor, Building Five at uh, Johnson Space Center during the uh, Apollo program. So uh, I had a chance to get to know him real well before we got to know him here in Pearland. So he's, he's a quality young man. Any other question or comment from Council? Madam Secretary, I believe we've got a motion second on four for George Sanders. Councilmember Car Carbone, how do you vote? Aye. Councilmember Little? Aye. Councilmember Hernandez? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Perez? Aye. Councilmember Owens? Aye. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Okay, moving to item number nine, Councilmember Little, would you do the honor? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration and possible action resolution number R2019-298, so moved. Second. A motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. Same uh, type of program, Mayor. It's the council's okay. prerogative on casting the votes from among those. Uh, presumably, uh, the one that you nominated, you'd support for the Fort Bend. Okay. Mayor, make a motion. We cast all our votes for Michael D. Roselle. Russell. Second. Second. Any further question or comment? Does um, what, what were the count? What were the numbers? Okay, good. Madam Secretary, I believe we have a motion second on for her. Council Member Little, how do you vote? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Perez? Aye. Councilmember Owens? Aye. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Moving new business item number 10, Councilmember Hernandez, would you present this for our consideration? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration and possible action resolution number R2019 299, so moved. Second. 
motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. Same, same. This is for the uh, Harris County, which we're a small percentage of in their scheme. Okay. Mayor, I'll make the motion we cast all our votes for Mike Sullivan. Second. Uh, Mike has been a um, representative of, and uh, a quality representative of that process, and uh, he looks at great favor on uh, the area of Missouri County. So, uh, Madam Secretary, I believe we have a motion second on the floor here. Councilmember Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Perez? Aye. Councilmember Owens? Aye. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Little? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Moving in our agenda to item number 13, Mayor Council issues for the City Council discussion. There are no issues for our discussion for the, now for the next meeting. Item 14 is the executive session of Texas Government Code Section 551.072 for consultation with city attorney regarding the sale, lease, or exchange of real property. Obviously, we can in the, uh, we cannot make a decision in the executive session, but it must be brought back to open session for handling. And uh, at this point, we looking at it, we're, we are recessing the executive session at 8.54. Term executive session at 909. As we in our agenda move to act to new business continued, which is item uh, new business item 11. And Council Member Moore, would you present this for our consideration? Consideration possible action uh, regarding the sale and lease of no action on this item. <laughs> No action, okay. Okay, with that information, then the, the council has returned to executive session at 9.010. Uh, other business, none. Adjournment at 9.011. Thank you. We are adjourned.